my salvation. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. The Lord is risen indeed.
glory to you, O God. You have won victory over death, raising Jesus from the grave and giving us eternal life. Glory to you, O Christ, for us and for our salvation. You overcame death and opened the gate to everlasting life. Glory to you, O Holy Spirit. You lead us into the truth. Glory to you, O blessed Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Beloved, Jesus rising from the dead assures us that we too have been given new life. Let us repent of our sin before God and one another, certain of God's mercy. Almighty God, by whose love our Lord Jesus Christ was sent to dwell among us, and by whose power he was raised to new life, we acknowledge that we are unworthy of your redeeming grace. We have not believed your promises, nor trusted in our living Lord. We have remained captive to doubt and fear, and our eyes have been closed to Christ's presence among us. Mired in disappointment, our hearts have not burned within us at the sound of your word. Consumed by our own needs and desires, we have ignored the plight of the poor, the hungry, and the oppressed. We have been callous toward those who mourn, indifferent toward your call to pursue peace in our time. Forgive us, we pray, and restore unto us the joy of your salvation, that we may trust in you to raise us to new and abundant life through Jesus Christ, our Lord.
Amen. By the grace of God and by the witness of our ancestors, the good news of Jesus' resurrection is our rock and our salvation. You shall not die, but live. The rejected cornerstone has become your strength and your song. Beloved, hear and believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In the name of our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, welcome into this time of worship and into the community that is Shadyside Presbyterian Church. Please do sign the friendship pads, either at the end of your pew or online to let us know of your presence with us and how best we can be caring for and praying alongside of you in this time. Whether you are a longtime member of this community or are worshiping with us for the first time, we pray that you will experience deeply the magnificent promises of the God who loves you enough to bear the weight of sin and death, who is powerful enough to rise victorious and gracious enough to welcome each and every one of us into glory. Following worship, we invite you to join us downstairs in the parish hall for a celebratory time of fellowship. And if you see someone who might be newer to this community, please introduce yourself and invite them to join you and help them to find the way to the parish hall. Friends, we serve a living Lord who is at work in the world through the community that Christ is gathering even now into his eternal presence. So please take a moment to read in your bulletin or the church website about all the ways that we, the church, are participating in God's life-giving work of love and justice and grace. And prayerfully consider where and how you are being called to participate in that work. And now as those who have received new life in Christ, let us pray that God's holy word might be opened unto us. Living God, with you we celebrate the presence of your risen word. 
Enliven our hearts by your Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Hear now God's word for us this day. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-matured wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-matured wines strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheet that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces, and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him so that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Let us pray. O Christ, our Redeemer, you are the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's nature, whom death could not conquer nor the tomb imprison. As you have shared in our frail, vulnerable, fearful humanity, help us so to share in your resurrection. Then, O God, beyond all praising, when we who trust in the inevitability of death find ourselves face to face with life, receive our astonished, fearful, bewildered selves, as would a loving parent who comforts a frightened child with the reassurance that your perfect love casts out fear. Amen. Our second reading comes to us from the terse gospel according to Mark, the 16th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Listen again for the word of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One should pay attention when biblical scholars of almost every stripe, progressive and evangelical, conservative and liberal, Pentecostal and Presbyterian, Reformed and Roman Catholic alike, agree. As you might imagine, such lockstep affirmation happens infrequently among devoted students of Scripture. And yet, somehow, most biblical scholars agree that the gospel according to Mark ends right here with verse 8. With the women who had come to anoint Jesus' body, fleeing his tomb in stunned silence and fear. Most scholars agree that this is where the evangelist Mark, who characteristically wastes no words and moves sometimes abruptly from one event to another, from parable to sermon to healing wrought by Jesus, they agree that this is where Mark draws the curtain on Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And so it follows that the Gospel of Mark ends with verse 8, with fear at the forefront of what is yet to come, leaving its readers to use their own imaginations to access their own longings when considering what could possibly come next. Of course, that's not what the Pew Bible in front of you says. More verses are added there for your reading pleasure, but you won't hear them this morning, because most scholars agree, and again, this is no small miracle, that Mark ends his version of the good news 
the gospel with women who run away, with women who run away and say, as the Greek renders it, nothing to nobody. In contrast to the way this double negative functions in English, in Koine Greek, it only intensifies what has been said, such that this phrase reads something like, they said nothing, not anything, to anyone. So just in case you were wondering whether Mark really meant that the women kept silent, well, that intensity should clear things up. Despite several requests for confirmation that I really was ending the gospel reading with verse 8 this morning on Easter morning for crying out loud, that is what I've done, and it's not without precedent, mind you. The first questioning of this decision came just moments after I hit send on the bulletin information that went out to the rest of the staff weeks ago. The last came just yesterday afternoon when our live stream team wanted to double check, to touch base, just to make sure that I hadn't planned to read on through verses 9 through 20. Well, there were enough questions in between those two requests to raise an eyebrow or two. Some of those questions, my own. But in response to all of those questions, and especially to my own questions as to why I just didn't relent and preach on the Easter text from the Gospel according to John, we're stopping at verse 8. And we're stopping with verse 8, not only because I'm being stubborn about it, though that may very well be the case, but also because all the evidence we have from the best, most complete original manuscripts and from our understanding of the historical context of those manuscripts' original readers contends that that's where Mark called it quits. With verse 8, with silence, and fleeing, and fear. And not with what I call the hot dog meat of random explanation that attempts to clean up the scraps of fear and terror and gather them into a neat conglomerate package of resurrection and post-resurrection appearances, perfect with a swipe of spicy mustard and relish if you just don't think too hard about what you're actually taking in. No, today we end with verse eight because that's where scholars agree Mark ended his gospel. But now, of course, Houston, we have a problem. Or Pittsburgh, as it were. It's no small thing to trust that the gospel, that any story at all that claims to be good news for all people could possibly end this way. I understand why you want to read on. I do too. Hey, let's see the risen Christ for ourselves. Like Thomas in next week's gospel text, we'd really like to touch the wounds of the risen Christ instead of being left in limbo. But Mark leaves us with not a single glimpse of Jesus' thrice forgiving Peter for his three denials. There's not a speck of Jesus offering peace to disciples locked away in fear. Here in Mark, there's not one word of Jesus' tenderly calling the name of the weeping Mary Magdalene at the scene. And I get it. Without any of that, we are left only with fear and hope and a choice to make about which of those roads we want to explore more fully. Thing is, neither road is mutually exclusive. Perhaps both journeys overlap. But to see our way down this one path with any clarity, we may have to back up a bit to the beginning rather than the end of Mark's last chapter. The women wait until the Sabbath is over to go to the tomb. 
And one cannot help but admire their devotion, not only to Jesus, with whom they stayed at the cross when all others had long fled, but also to the Sabbath commandment. And one cannot help but notice the way that these women were willing to do the -the behind-the-scenes unpleasant work of encountering a body that their experience would have told them would already have begun to decompose. This is the kind of work we in our current society tend to leave to the professionals, is it not? We separate ourselves from the stench of death. So one cannot help but admire the fact that these women were willing to do the dirty work, leaving home in darkness but awaiting the sunrise so as first to honor the God of Israel. These women were faithful. They were sturdy. They were steadfast. What the Gospel writer is telling us is that these were not the kind of women who were most likely to run away in fear. It's interesting to me, though, that the women do not plan a bit better. When I have to move a heavy load, I text my strapping teenage son, and I offer him a tank of gasoline on me in return for his brute strength and willingness. But Mark, who wastes no words, says they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us? from the entrance to the tomb. The very next verse tells us that the stone was very large, muy grande, as in we cannot overestimate how large and heavy this stone was. The women would have seen the stone moved into place, so they knew for a fact that they couldn't move it themselves, and they're clearly worried about such an obstacle to the task at hand enough to say over and over to one another in the fashion of those who speak about a problem with anxiety that this might be a problem of the first order. And still somehow, that isn't enough for them to collectively problem solve ahead of time. Hmm, I wonder about that. Elsewhere in Scripture, Jesus tells us not to worry. After all, therefore I tell you, do not worry about what you will eat or drink or about what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? Can any of these women, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome, by worrying, move a stone that is physically impossible for them to move? Of course not. And here's the crux. Turns out they don't have to. All that worrying was for nothing. And this is why I believe Jesus tells us not to worry, not because we won't worry, but because he is sure we will. And Jesus knows us well enough to know that humans are going to worry, so he gives a description rather than a prescription. Worrying won't help us. Isn't it true that half the time we don't even know what to worry about? As is evidenced here in this final terse chapter, according to Mark, the women are worried about the wrong thing, about something they themselves have no power to change. And yet, to their astonishment, the stone is rolled away. The conclusion of the gospel writer being that only God could have accomplished what these women, sturdy as they were, could not. The women were rightly alarmed at what came next. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white sitting on the right side. 
I think we've tamed this story by hearing it over and over again, and so I personally believe that alarmed is an understatement. The terror and amazement that are described a bit later in this text sort of get at the feeling a bit more. These women came expecting death in all its gruesome reality. Now, how are they to know what to think? Alarmed seems like a good start. It's spot on, and yet they are told in the characteristic language of angels, do not be alarmed. Additionally, they are given a charge. Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, this is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Just as he told you. Remember how he told you? Just as he told you, the young angelic figure in white says, so do not be alarmed. But we all know how well it works when someone tells us mid-fear not to be afraid. <laughs> So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Curtain. That's it? Pastor and theologian the Reverend Matthew Gaventa ponders this ending of the Gospel of Mark this way. Do not be alarmed, the angel says to characters who are pretty understandably alarmed. You've heard this one before. It's what angels say, though evidently it works a lot better on the shepherds. After all, they run towards the action in Bethlehem. Here at the tomb, the women flee. Maybe Luke's angels are just better at their job? Or maybe the women's silence is a nod to the Markan community worshiping and gathering under threat of discovery. Regardless, it's worth noting that the instructions this angel gives seem to burst forth the pressure valve of confidentiality that has been building throughout this gospel. Now, finally, a story built over and over on secrecy don't tell anyone who I am, Jesus says, infamously and repeatedly. Now, finally, the instruction is, go and tell. At last. But they don't. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. So maybe we have to face it head on. Gaventa says, Am I the only one a bit angry with these women? I know that's not the fashion, and surely they deserve credit for showing up in the first place, but it's also hard to read their departure in this final verse as anything but failure. Jesus told them what was going to happen, and it happened. The angel told them what to do, and instead they run. And because this is not the ending I want, or the ending that I need, or even an ending in which the central event of the cosmos, as I understand it, seems to have any visible significance for the unfolding of history, it just happens. And then everybody runs away with no visible further consequence. I'm searching around for something to do with my disappointment, and it may as well be this. It may as well be taking it out on these women as if I would have done anything different. But I was given no such moment, says Gaventa. They, not I, stood inside the empty tomb and heard the words of the angel, and they failed to do what God asked them to do. And in their failure, I see our failure. In their failure, I see the failure of the mainline evangelical project. 
After all, every year the numbers get a little smaller. The screw turns just a bit tighter. Whatever story we are telling is not meeting the people where they want to be met, and in return the pews are just a bit emptier and the mood just a bit more dour. And I know what church growth is supposed to look like because I read about it in the Gospels of Matthew, Luke, and John, which means I know enough to know that that's not what's happening here. These women are failing, and in their failure, I see my failure. Because if I were doing it right, if I were serving this church right, if I were doing my job right, if I was heeding this call right, if I were speaking with some right courage, some words that I cannot find, if I were rightly going wherever I was supposed to go and rightly telling whatever I was supposed to tell to whomever I'm supposed to tell it to, then I think the people would show up and the numbers would go up and Matthew and Luke and John would be so proud and the story could end the way that it's meant to end, or at least the way they want it to end, not with a whimper, but with a chorus. Instead, Gaventa says, these women said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And I'm disappointed, mostly, I suspect, with myself. I think the Reverend Gaventa is right, and not only because he's one of my best friends from seminary, but also because I experience disappointment with the women of Mark 16 as disappointment with myself. Because you see, I'm trying hard to follow Jesus all the way from the word that co-created all that there is to the law in which God's followers are to delight, to the inspired words of the prophets who seek righteousness and justice, through the wisdom spoken and sung in Proverbs and Psalms, to the manger in Bethlehem, to waters of his baptism in the Jordan, to the hillsides and lake shores and mountains and plains of his ministry in first century Palestine, to the table where he broke bread and poured out wine and love and forgiveness for his friends, to the garden of Gethsemane where he prayed to the cross and the grave and through his resurrection, I'm trying to follow Jesus. And all the way up to his death and burial, well, that part, I pretty much understand, or at least I try to understand. But resurrection, well, that isn't rational. And you see, I'm disappointed in the women who flee and remain silent, and I'm disappointed in myself and in my own struggling as they once did. These women stuck with Jesus to the bitter end when everyone else had fled, but now it's their turn to cut and run. And they do, just as afraid as all the others. But even as we are disappointed in these women, perhaps it behooves us to be grateful for their honesty. Fear might just be the most honest response, the only believable response to the starting and startling promise of resurrection come true. If we are courageous enough this Easter Sunday morning to be honest with ourselves, well, aren't we willing to admit that we're afraid? What is it that keeps you up at night? What soundtrack of anxious toil do you, in your most vulnerable and real moments, repeat in your heart and mind on loop? Are you afraid of the diagnosis, of the treatment for the diagnosis? Are you afraid of being alone? or of being together in a relationship that's nothing but conflict? 
Are you afraid of losing your livelihood or your memory or your abilities or your friends? Aren't you afraid that no matter how much you love God, you will fail to be faithful, as is evidenced by the long trail of wanting to please God on the one hand and falling short of that righteous desire on the other? Aren't you afraid, if you're honest, that wars will never cease and that God won't actually wipe every tear away from every eye? Aren't you afraid that God won't, as promised, swallow up death forever? Aren't you afraid that no matter how much you want to trust that faith, rather than fear, has the last word, that everyone that you know who has died is dead? Aren't you afraid that all this talk of resurrection is pie in the sky? The stuff of fairy tales serving only to cast aside our anxiety over death. What a stone across our hearts that one is. In the face of all of this fear, all I have to say to you, friends, is take heart. For the gospel, according to Mark, invites us to get a little more comfortable with our fear. Do you remember when Jesus told his disciples that if the crowds were quiet, even the stones would shout out? I've heard this short ending of Mark preached in such a way so as to suggest that the gospel writer wraps all disciples in every time and place, you and me, into the story. We, along with the women who approach the tomb, hear the angel's instructions to go and tell. And so it is up to us. And so we must go and tell in order for the story of good news to be perpetuated generation to generation. As a pastor who likes to motivate people toward righteousness and justice, I like that sermon very much. But I don't think that's the sermon the gospel writer Mark would have us hear. Because it isn't up to us, is it? Sometimes I think, surely, there must have been a leak. Someone must have told. One of the women, overwhelmed with joy, perhaps she got past her fear, given a few moments to think things through. Maybe she remembered what Jesus had said, that he would go ahead of them to Galilee. I like to think there was a leak. Because here we are this day proclaiming the astonishing truth of Jesus' life and death and resurrection. We are here, perhaps because someone told. But I think what Mark might say to us is that it doesn't depend on us, that even if there had not been a leak, even if the women themselves were too afraid to speak, the story would not have ended there. Hear the good news, the gospel message for all people. Even we who strive to be faithful may fail to go and tell the good news of Jesus Christ our story could very well end with fear. Even so, we are afraid, and Jesus is still raised. We are afraid, and the stone we are so worried about moving has been moved for us already. We are afraid, too afraid to tell out what we have seen and heard, too afraid to say that we have not comprehended it all. Even so, the stones cry out the glory of God. 
We are afraid, but fear does not have the last word because God's perfect love casts out fear. And this is the truth. We serve a God who is an expert in rolling away stones for us, even the hardest ones to move, the stones of our own hearts. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
empowered by God's gracious Holy Spirit, let us now proclaim together the faith by which we are held fast. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he was suffered and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Early in the morning, while the earth was still cloaked in three-day-long darkness, while grief hovered heavily and the ground still shook with tremors of fear and the tears of your beloved ones watered the soil, early in the morning, Lord God, you rose. Early on this morning, we strive to wrap our minds around it, to make sense of it, and yet, in the end, have to confess, we must simply rest within it. That preposterous yet persistent good news that you are risen indeed. And so we live, and so we hope, and so we strive to believe, and so we order our lives, no longer mere mortals destined to die, but children of the living one. Glory to you, O God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. God of resurrection, you bring new life to that which is dead every day. With all the boldness Easter allows us, we pray you, bring that resurrection here and now. We pray for those for whom the soil covering the grave of a loved one is still too freshly turned, for all whose cheeks are yet stained with tears. We pray for those for whom anthems of Alleluia resound with painful dissonance, whose deep pain proves impenetrable to songs of joy. And where death still stalks your beloved ones, where crucifixions all too real steal the breath of cherished children, where precious life is extinguished as quickly and commonly as a tenebrae candle, there especially risen Christ hasten the reality of Easter, where the violence goes on and 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 on. We pray you in your resurrection splendor forth from the empty tomb, stride on and 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 take us with you. Do not leave us mere witnesses to the mystery, but roll away the stones that would hold us in death's grasp, that we might join that joyous procession of the living. So raise the hopes of all who mourn. Raise the flagging faith of all who are weary. Raise the courage of those you have called according to your purpose. Raise the dead in imagination and in conscience. And raise our voices in praise 
as we join the chorus of all creation calling Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. We pray it in the name of the risen, reigning Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you may remember if you frequent these pews, back in autumn, an anthem was commissioned to honor 60 years of Dr. Peggy Mills' faithful service to this church through her sharing of the gift of song in its choir. Today, though our attention is first and rightly focused on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we also pause to recognize that because of Christ being raised, we may also rightly give our lives and our praise as a living sacrifice. Today's offertory anthem has been composed by Dr. Mark A. Anderson to the glory of God and in honor of Boyd S. Murray's 60 years of faithful service singing in Shadyside Presbyterian's choir. On this day, we offer gratitude for gifts so generously shared and for generations to come, May our song ever be Alleluia.
Holy God, you shower us with gifts so abundant, we cannot measure them all. You give us life itself and the power to befriend our companions in this world. Bless these gifts for the sake of those in need. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier, one God, now and forever. Amen. Faithful people of God, Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. Go and tell that truth. Go into God's world in peace. And failing that, go into God's world in fear, trusting that human fear is one of God's favorite raw materials and that God never leaves it alone, but works with fear to bring about God's glory. As you go, may God's blessing be upon you and upon those whom you love and upon those whom only God loves. 
this Easter festival day and even forevermore. Amen.